Gonna eat a bunch of chia, gonna eat a bunch of flax, gonna eat a bunch of veggies, because that's how I'm gonna get my fiber. That's what we think of when we think fiber. And sure, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with chia and flax, but there are five interesting types of fiber that don't get a lot of attention. And some of them aren't even really fibers at all, but they act as fibers once they go inside our body. So I've got different categories for each as we go too. So it'll help you with different, I don't know, issues or potential like solutions for things. So let's go ahead and jump right in. The first one is technically not a fiber at all. Collagen protein. Wait, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, believe it or not, collagen protein has what are called polysaccharides in it. So it's not legally a fiber. Okay, now a fiber as far as the FDA is concerned has to be what is called a fermentable demonstrable, which means it needs to uh, literally ferment and it needs to be able to be measured as a demonstrable. But that leaves a lot to be desired with what are called polysaccharides. Now in plants, you have various forms of starches, right? You have starches, you have oligosaccharides, you have sugars, and all these things get broken down into monosaccharides and ultimately affect blood sugar and to a certain degree affect the microbiome. But then you have what are called non-starch polysaccharides. And collagen, because of the interesting matrix and how it's made up, actually has a fair bit of non-starch polysaccharides. So that means it's not literally a plant fiber, but it has polysaccharides that need to get broken down by the gut. Now, these are polysaccharides that we do not have the enzymes for. So we do not break these things down and they do not affect our blood glucose in the traditional way. But our gut microbiome can break these polysaccharides down, getting us a gut benefit in addition to, of course, we talk about collagen being really good for the gut mucosal layer and for the membrane, but that's different. We're talking about actual fiber-like properties. It's super interesting. Now, collagen would be good for, well, people that I guess are doing carnivore for one, but collagen is also really good for people that have a super sensitive stomach to fibers, but you're still wanting to do the right thing. Like I talk to a lot of people that say, I can't have Brussels sprouts. Like they make me super bloated. You might need to start smaller and collagen is a great way to be able to at least kind of get some polysaccharides in there that probably aren't going to negatively impact you. Then we move into the next one, which is one that's not talked about a whole lot, and that is cellulose. Now cellulose is usually thrown away as sort of just a fiber that doesn't have a whole lot of purpose. But there's some relatively newer research that's starting to point some cool stuff out with cellulose. There was a study that was published in the journal Gut Microbes that found that cellulose was particularly powerful when it came down to like colitis and gut inflammation. Now the cool thing about cellulose is it's an insoluble fiber, which means it's not going to draw a lot of water in. So as far as bang for the buck with like roughage and like helping your poop is concerned, it's probably not the most powerful, but as far as remodeling the microbiome to potentially help out there, it's pretty powerful. Essentially what they've found is that when subjects, in this particular case mice, went on diets that were low in cellulose, they ended up having more crypt cell atrophy, which are specific cells in our colon, and they ended up having more goblet cell atrophy. So they were like deplenishing their goblet cells, which means basically their colon was a little less healthy. So where do you get cellulose? Now cellulose is in the skins of plants, like skins of certain fruits and certain vegetables. Here's a very important note, okay? Cellulose is something you probably want to get from fruit skins rather than plant skins. With plant skins, you're going to have a high degree of oxalates and phytic acid and things like that that in abundance may not be the best thing. Okay, It's a defense chemical that plants create. And I'm not an anti-plant guy, I'm just a realist. But with fruits like apples and pears that have high amounts of cellulose in the skin, you can get the cellulose with less of the impact of oxalates and phytic acid. So if you're conscious of that, it's very, very good. So it's really good for people that might have a little bit of gut pain that are seeing if this can help mediate it. Which leads me to the next one, which is by far, based upon the research, the most powerful for weight loss. And it's not just because it curbs your appetite. We're talking about glucomannan fiber. Okay, this is the stuff in shirataki noodles. It comes from like the cognac root. There's companies called like New Pasta that have it, uh, Miracle Noodle, and I'm not sponsored by any of them. This is just talking about it. You can do a Google search for foods rich in glucomannan fiber, but it's pretty isolated. So shirataki noodles is usually what it is. But check this out, it's fascinating. There was a study published in Obesity Medicine that took, there was a meta-analysis, it took a look at six large trials and it found that in these trials, subjects that consumed more glucoman and fiber had more weight loss. Glucoman and fiber led to significant, not just a modest amount, but significant weight loss. Now you look at this and you think, is it just calories though? Like, 
Are they consuming more fiber? And they're eating less. And yes, that probably is the case in a natural sort of ad libitum setting. But there was a study that put that whole concept to bed in a controlled setting. So this study took a look at 176 participants, so a large scale study. They had them consume glucomannan fiber or placebo along with a controlled calorie restriction diet. So they put them both in a deficit of the same amount, same calorie controlled. One group had glucomannan fiber, one group did not. The glucomannan fiber group lost way more weight, even when calories were controlled. So there's something happening with glucomannan fiber that encourages weight loss independent of just eating less. Okay, now it's theorized that it has to do with controlling the blood sugar spike. Like it's so powerful at reducing the amount of like how, how high the blood sugar spikes. It also reduced the insulin spike significantly and delayed the insulin spike. With a pretty decent size of our population being insulin resistant, it's safe to kind of assume that, well, maybe this was improving that because it was over five weeks. So they, a lot of different like pieces you could poke holes in here, but very interesting. So probably has to do with the blood sugar modulation, the insulin modulation, and of course, just the satiety in an ad libitum situation. But there's also the question of maybe it was actually slowing down or even inhibiting the absorption of some of the actual calories. Maybe it was even slowing down or stopping the absorption of some of the calories from fat. Either way, independent of caloric restriction, how much they were like cutting out, they lost more weight. There was also probably a huge microbiome benefit as well, which all the fibers I'm talking about, I think it's super critical to remember that no matter what the fiber, you're having a remodeling of the gut microbiome and potentially improving gut diversity. So with all of these, if you're taking people that don't typically eat a lot of fiber and now you're making them eat fiber, they're gonna have an improvement in their gut microbiome, which has a huge impact on glucose tolerance, fatty acid oxidation, mood, satiety, the gut brain axis, all these things that regulate or are regulated by our gut with short chain fatty acids in one way or another. So whether it's collagen, whether it's cellulose, whether it's glucomannan or these other ones that I'm gonna talk about, it's all about gut diversity as well. So if you're adding fibers in, you're making these changes, I would usually recommend also adding a good probiotic. Now I'm not just trying to make a pitch here, this is the one that I personally use, so take it or leave it. It's called Seed, and the link down below will save you 15% off. It's Literally, it's the only probiotic that I would ever recommend because I think most of them are total garbage. Honestly, they are. And Seed at least puts their money where their mouth is when it comes down to microbiome research. They spend a ton of their own profits on that. They conduct their own research. And I just think it's legit. And they have this cool tech with a capsule inside of a capsule. So it's like multi-stage delivery of the probiotics and the prebiotics called a symbiotic. Anyhow, the link is down below. That'll save you 15% off your entire purchase with Seed for their daily symbiotic. I just recommend whenever you're having a dietary change, to add that into the mix to get that diversity sort of kickstart. So that link is down below. Leads me into the next one, which is probably the best kind of fiber for remodeling your microbiome in the first place. So let's say you've had a bad diet for a long time and you're starting to make some serious changes. What fiber should you implement to get the most microbiome bang for the buck? With that, I lean into inulin. Now, inulin is not just something you see in processed food. That's like an isolated inulin that's very different. We're talking about inulin from asparagus, from artichokes, even a little bit in like green bananas that aren't all the way ripe. That's what kind of gives it that texture. Okay, but also we have uh, garlic. Like garlic is huge with inulin. That's why when you eat a bunch of garlic, yeah, you can kind of stink it up at night, right? Because you have this fermenting that's happening. So inulin is very powerful for that. There's a study that was published in the BMJ that found that inulin triggered massive changes in bifidobacterium and a bunch of other good bacteria. So remodeling the microbiome, that's definitely the way to go. The problem is you gotta start small because you might get bloated with it. So if you're sensitive to fibers, maybe start with a few stalks of asparagus. I think asparagus is the least bloating out of all of these. Okay, when you start moving into like artichokes, that's a very long chain inulin, especially Jerusalem artichokes, so you start getting this heavy bloating that comes with it. Garlic, little bits at a time. So maybe just start small, work your way up. It's a great way to sort of build up to it. And then this other fiber, this next one, is one that people don't talk about all the time, and it's, in my opinion, it's the best for glucose regulation. If you battle with high blood glucose, independent of losing weight, let's talk about this. I'm talking about beta-glucans. Okay, so beta-glucans are in mushrooms. It's what makes mushrooms slimy. That sounds like a shirt. 
<laughs> what makes mushroom slimy, but also the seaweed. What's what makes seaweed slimy? So if you get seaweed snacks, okay, but also oats. I'm not a big fan of eating copious amounts of grains, but if you get like gluten-free oats, you heat them up and then you cool them down or something, you still get the resistant starch, you get in a small amount, less blood sugar impact, and you still get the beta-glucans. Uh, also rye, sorghum, things like that, but not as big of a fan of the grain category. There was a study in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Uh, it looked at healthy people, but it gave them white bread and yogurt for breakfast alongside muesli that had either three grams of beta-glucans or four grams of beta-glucans. Here's what's really super wackadoodle weird about this. The three gram beta-glucan group didn't have any change in blood glucose, but the four gram group had a ridiculously high change. So somewhere between three and four grams in this study made a huge difference. It just goes to show that sometimes you can increase like a certain fiber, it's not gonna have an impact and you gotta go upscale a little bit. In this case, four grams seemed to do the trick. But that was in healthy people. It's a lot harder to make a dent in healthy people a lot of times, believe it or not. In unhealthy people, it's easier. So if people that are insulin resistant, things like that. So with that, we look at a study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care. And this took a look at subjects that along with their breakfast had either four, six, or 8.4 grams of beta-glucans. They found a dose-dependent relationship on how it affected blood glucose. The four gram group had a 38% improvement in their blood sugar levels postprandial after eating. The six gram group had a 42% change and the 8.4 gram group had a 67% improvement in their glucose levels after eating. Okay, so I'm gonna start putting mushrooms on everything because it just makes sense at this point because they're high in beta glucans and heck yeah. But they also found that there was a 59 to 67% less insulin spike with the high beta glucan group. So the more beta-glucans, it delayed the insulin spike and it attenuated it. So for someone that's insulin resistant or is battling high glucose levels, it just makes sense. Like something here is very, very positively correlated with that. And we can go down rabbit holes of what it is, but heck, this seems like a very simple thing to be adding in. So just to recap, we have the collagen, we have the cellulose, like the skins of, of fruits, okay? We have the glucoman and fiber, so like the shirataki noodle type stuff. We have the inulin, like the artichokes and the asparagus. And then lastly, we have the beta-glucans, like the mushrooms and the seaweed. So as always, keep it locked here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.